Welcome to Geotape Lectures. Our speaker today is Raiden Twarak. He's going to tell us about mathematical virology, geometry, and the fight against virus infection. Take it away, Raiden. This opportunity to speak about viruses here today, and I apologize again for the um, cancellation when I had a viral infection, so the viruses are fighting back making it even more important now to look at the mathematics of viruses and seeing how far this can help to identify novel antiviral solution. Next slide, please. At the beginning of my talk, I would like to focus on the so-called viral capsids. These are protein containers that encapsulate the viral genomes. You see here an image that is a cryo-electron microscopy image that has been further um, processed with imaging techniques using the symmetry of those viruses. And you see at the bottom left this um, capsid that has all these little units that when you zoom in even further in the middle at the bottom show you these donut-like arrangements like a lattice type arrangement. Each of them represents in this case six individual proteins that are shown on the bottom right in colors and these colors are just there to show you where the individual proteins are sitting, but these are actually identical proteins. You can guess from a mathematical point of view what we're interested in is to predict and understand the construction principles under the placements of these protein units and of these clusters. Next slide, please. Here you see an image of different viruses that all have one feature in common, that is their symmetry. They all have icosahedral symmetry. You see on the right hand side the characteristics of icosahedral symmetry. You have these five, two, and three fold symmetry axes that are at the vertices, at the edges, and in the centers of triangles of an icosahedron. But as you can see clearly on the left, even though they all share that symmetry, they are very distinct on the outside. And the question in this talk will be, what are the mathematical principles that underpin these different viral architectures? Next slide, please. The motivation for this study is twofold. Number one is that we repurpose those containers in virus nanotechnology, where we use them either as transport vehicles or for um, storage of energy. So there are different, on diagnostic purposes, we have different uh, applications for these containers. And these containers shown here are all plant viruses that are actually used in nanotechn nanotechnology applications. And you can see their surfaces are very different. So clearly there must be different advantages or disadvantages in using one example over the other. And the mathematics can help you to understand their biophysical properties as I'm going to show you later in this talk. In the second part of my talk, um, we are looking for novel opportunities to design antiviral strategies this has to do with the formation of these containers, the dynamic properties of the building blocks of these containers to come together to form these viral capsids. This is then bringing in further biophysical arguments to do with how these containers form and release their cargoes. Next slide, please. So here you see the early models of virus architecture that were introduced by Kaspar and Klug, shown on the right hand side here. So in this work, they realized that structures that are organized by archosal symmetry should have mathematical rules that account for the placement of these different proteins. And in this case, they were asking the question, what are typical arrangements that are such that the local environment around individual proteins is identical all across the capsid surface? This brings us mathematically to lattice problems. So they were asking in mathematical terms, are there surface lattices that can account for the organization of these viral containers? They used hexagonal lattices. You can see this in this middle picture here and constructed planar embeddings of the surface of an icosahedron in these lattices then wrapped up the lattice around the icosahedral surface to create these 3D shapes. The famous construction is the T number construction, as we call it, because it counts the number of smaller triangles that can make up the larger triangular faces of an icosahedron. And that's been used in virology for a long time now to classify viruses. 
Next slide, please. However, this is not the entire story and this brings the mathematician to the table. So I show you just two examples on the right hand side where this theory is not sufficient to account for virus structures that have actually been observed in nature. The first example is phage basilisk where you have a capsid that is formed from different species of proteins, so a large and a smaller protein, a major and minor capsid protein. In this case, you can no longer reasonably assume that the local environments for each of these different species must be the same in the capsid surface. So you are entering the realm of different types of lattices, as we're going to discuss in this talk. Then on the right hand side, you see a capsid that is formed from the same type of protein building block, but this protein building block can form groups of five. We call them pentamers. And again, as you can see from the crystallographic restriction and lattice theory, it is not possible to follow that same idea of using planar lattices and then embedding the surface of the icosahedron into them in order to construct these structures. So we will need other types of mathematics to describe them. And there's a large body of work that we are going to touch upon in this um, in this talk, spanning early work in 2004, but coming to very recent ongoing work where we still expand on, on the modeling of the so-called non-crystallographic structures. Next slide, please. So we first start with the um, generalization of the tiling approach. So Casper and Klug used the hexagonal lattice because they used the motivation from individual protein building blocks using an assemb self-assembly process, the same local environments to build a larger structure. And what we're doing here is to revisit that and say, well, if we have different types of proteins or if we have different domains in a protein that can occupy different positions in a lattice, then this criterion that the lattice has to have precisely the same plaquettes from which it is formed as would be the case in a hexagonal or triangular lattice is too restrictive. What we really want is that these different species do the same interaction with each other, which from a mathematical point of view means we want lattices that are vertex transitive, i.e. we have vertices that are identical across the lattice, but we allow the individual species to form different types of clusters, so we can have different plaquettes, as you can see here, here mixes of hexagons, squares, triangles, and so on. These lattices have been classified. Kepler has already reported these 11 Archimedean lattices. So what we've done in this work here is to revisit that and ask the question for which of these lattices can we repeat a construction akin to that of Kasper and Klug. This leads to a classification that generates four different types of series of polyhedra. The first one is the Kasper Klug series that's being used in virology widely at the moment. But then there are three other classes in which the fundamental domain of the structure is larger. So instead of having, and I'm sorry, I have no point at the moment. So instead of having this little red triangle that would be the fundamental domain of this um, hexagonal lattice here, you can see in the following pictures then with the blue and green uh, units, and we have additional units in the fundamental domain of these lattices, and that is what nature exploits. So it basically either uses it for additional domains of a protein or to accommodate different types of proteins. What we've done in this work is then to classify these four series and look at their respective sizes. So we mesh them according to size with each other. And that, that gave us the ability to answer a couple of uh, questions in virology. So the first one concerns the evolution of viruses. There is a big question how viruses in evolutionary terms have actually transitioned from small structures to larger structures and overcome this big jump from what's a T1 and a T3 to 4 structure in Casper and Kluge theory. Because as we said in Casper and Kluge theory, the number of proteins that can be used is quantized. And there is a jump from 60 proteins to around 80 proteins. How would a virus do this? This theory tells you that this is possible by using different types of lattices. In particular, for certain types of lattices, you can use gyration whereby the different 
lattice units like a triangle and a hexagon here can vary in size with regards to each other so therefore actually accommodate the growing of certain domains or the swap of certain domains and indeed this has been subsequently observed in nature and we come to that later but the important part for us is that this theory explains structures that have not been seen before and, even more importantly, distinguishes with, between structures that previously were classed as the same geometry. Uh, next slide, please. So here we see an example of that. And that's quite instructive of how the mathematics can actually help us to understand the biophysics of these viruses. Here we see a set of um, plant viruses and phages that all have one property in common. They're in the Casper and Klug classification in this T equals 3 uh, classification. So they basically all are formed from 180 proteins. And according to the Casper Klug theory, they follow the same type of surface architecture. But if you revisit that from the point of view of lattice theory, you see that this is actually not quite right there are subtle differences between them and these are important can we go to the next slide please so here you see oops um yeah here you see this difference um playing out so at the top you see these three different types of tiling models that you can have according to this classification for a capsid that is formed from 180 proteins so on the left you see a triangulation where each plaquette is formed from three proteins they're shown in different colors in the middle part you see a kite tiling so if you can make out there's like a kite shape a red a green and a blue structure together form what looks like a kite and on the right hand side we have dimers which are each formed from two proteins there's either the green dimer from two green proteins or a red blue dimer um, around the particle five fold axis the dual tilings to these tilings are giving us information about the interaction pattern between the proteins. On the bottom here, you can, what you see is when you put a vertex at the center of each plaquette and then you connect vertices if they share an edge, then you see this other polyhedral shell here, which is embodying information about interactions between protein units. And as you can guess for both assembly and disassembly, both the types of plaquettes and the interactions between these plaquettes is important for the assembly or disassembly outcome. Can we please go further? So here you see those structures again, and I want to highlight the crucial differences in the tiling type and tiling descriptor. So each of them shares a property with one of the others. So for instance, the triangular tiling is formed from 60 tiles because each tile consists of three proteins, and so is the kite tiling. However, when you look at the connectivity between them, you see that it's actually a three connected graph for the triangular situation, but the kite situation is a four connected graph like the rhombic tiling, whereas the rhombic tiling then has 90 tiles because they each represent two proteins. Now, using that classification that comes out of the lattice theory, we know there is nothing else that can happen. So in order to see what is the spectrum of possible behavior we can see in, say, the disassembly of these capsids, we can use these models and base our um, assembly study or disassembly study on these models. And here I want to demonstrate how we've done that for this particular case, but then again, this can be generalized to other cases as well. So what we've done here is a simulation where we randomly take out plaquettes or edges, if we break bonds, um, of, from these different structures. And we ask the question when we remove a certain fraction of those vertices in this case and then you have to use the fraction because we have different numbers of tiles in these different geometries so we want to make it comparable which means that we need to talk about fraction rather than the actual number so for a certain fraction removed we look how many disconnected components we have and we do this a thousand times so we repeat that simulation and then we basically look um, uh, what is the probability of having a certain number of connected components when we're removing a certain number of plaquettes and we are putting a dashed line 
at the moment where we for the first time have two components where the structure breaks apart. And as you can see for these different geometries, this is happening at different times. So clearly the resistance to fragmentation is very different for these structures and the mathematics gives us a way of predicting which one performs how and how they compare. Namely, the triangular lattice has a fragmentation threshold of 0.2 to 6, um, which is the smallest one here, so it is more readily falling apart. The car tiling is most resilient to fragmentation and the rhombing tiling is an intermediate case. This is quite interesting from a biological point of view because we see very few kite tilings actually. If you go on the Viper database and look for different virus structures, you see that this is very rare. But triangular structures and rhombic structures are rather common. But then you see a big difference between them. And here you see that actually this trend prevails. So when you're going to larger structures, then you still have this ranking of the rhombic structures with regards to triangulations. That is quite interesting for nanotech applications because it tells you what sort of cups that you want to use depending on what you want to achieve with your application. So we see already that geometry is quite important for the biophysical properties of these capsules. Um, can we go further, please? Now, I would like to segue into the non quasi quint capsid architectures. Um, we had this example at the beginning. This is this polyoma virus, cancer-causing virus that has 72 clusters of five proteins. Next uh, item, please. Comes on the same slide, it's automated. We need the middle bit. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So this is um, a problem that we are familiar with from physics in the description of quasi-crystals, alloys that have long range order but no periodicities. We also see these so-called non-crystallographic symmetries. And this is akin to what we're seeing here. We have a five-fold symmetry that clearly can tile the plane, but if we go even further <laughs> with one more, then we see that there are mathematical structures that have long range order with no periodicity. And we, we will in a minute see a uh, Penrose tiling on the right if our colleague presses the button one more time. Yeah, then it would come up. Thank you so much. So here you see the example of a planar structure that has this local symmetry as well. So you can make out little uh, five foot axes. They're quite easy to see because they're the lighter tiles. And this is very much akin to this problem we are f being faced here. We can't just use a surface lattice. We have to use a different construction. Next slide, please. So here we see the typical constructions that are used in the theory of quasi-crystals, and we can apply them also for viruses. And we've done that um, in the following way. So you see on the left-hand side an example of a Penrose tiling again, but we can embed its structure into a periodic lattice in a higher dimensional space and generate those structures then via projection. So the idea is we are looking for a dimension in which that non-crystallographic symmetry is actually crystallographic, so it is compatible with a lattice, not just a quasi-lattice. And then we are looking for invariant subspaces in that construction on which we can project the lattice points, and these lattice points then give us the vertices, in this case of a Penrose tiling, or in the complementary space, um, which is we call the control space. It's a space where we um, actually project the points that fall into this space are being re uh, projected into the lattice, and then only those points that fall into this control space actually get projected in the two-dimensional space to generate the quasi-lattice. If we were to project every point, we would get a dense set, so we need a way of selecting, and this is being done by basically, in a sense, using the unit cell of this high-dimensional space and projecting it, or using this control space. So now we have basically repeated that procedure um, of four viruses. In, what we've done first is to ask the question, what lattices actually give us icosidosymmetry as a crystallographic symmetry, and as such that we can find an invariant three-dimensional subspace in which we can actually project those structures and therefore construct these virus models. There is a classification that tells us there are only three 
such types in six dimension. It's a simple cubic, face centered cubic and body centered cubic lattice. And if we then project those ones in the complementary three dimensional space again and construct these vertices of tilings, then you obtain the structures as shown here in the middle. This is actually um, uh, a, a part of a three-dimensional Penrose tiling, a patch of a Penrose tiling in three dimensions that is formed from these two shapes that you can see at the bottom there, these two rhomb type shapes. And if you then look at the structure and try to construct a surface lattice again from that, so by basically taking spherical sections, then as this cartoon shows, you get these arrangements that give you, in this case, rhombs and kites. And the interesting thing about this construction is that it not only tells you the types of clusters you've got, but also their relative orientation and even more importantly, the bonds between them. So you see that uh, structures that are um, located on a ROM tile, there are dimer interactions, so interactions between a protein and the partner on the tile, whereas the trimer interactions are interactions between the three proteins. So this mathematical technique gives you not only the proteins themselves, but the interaction pattern. And this is quite important if you want to do work like I've shown at the beginning of this talk. And indeed, there's ongoing work with two French students where, that we're writing up at the moment, where we are doing a similar construction for these type of tilings via weighted networks on, um, on these polyhedral shells. Next slide, please. Here I would like to show you that this is only st the start of a journey in some way because there are different ways in which proteins can realize structures with local five-fold symmetries. The previous construction relied heavily, like the kasper glue construction, on the assumption that there's a single type of protein building block. And then a lattice picture is the right thing to proceed. However, we can have building blocks that have, say, are formed from two types of different proteins that one, um, for instance, in this case, forms predominantly five-fold um, clusters and the other one three-fold clusters. And in this case, you can't fully use the mathematics in this way. It's been designed, but you can actually use aspects of it and generate um, a classification in that way. So what we've done here is then work together with um, partners in biology who actually exploit that system in industry as well. This is a self-assembling protein that forms these nanoparticle structures. When they look at them experimentally, they find different peaks that correspond to different mass to charge ratios, but it's difficult for them to pinpoint what their structures actually really are. So they came to us to ask for help with a classification. Next slide, please. And what you can see here is then you have to formulate this problem in as a tiling problem where you take the nature of the biological objects into account. So in this case, we have these fused helices that extend to the interior of the particle. And actually we represent edges, um, we use edges to represent these fused chains, which are the protein building blocks of the particle. These can come together only in alternating ways, again, forming these five-fold and three-fold axes that are uh, respectively shown by a black dot and a white dot. And what we've done here is to introduce a new classification where we map these structures onto fullerene structures, use fullerene results and classifications, and map them back to get a full classification of the structures that can be found from these building blocks. You see three of our uh, polyhedral shells that we are getting in this way. They correspond to the start peaks of that structure. And our biological colleagues have then used those polyhedra as roadmaps to reconstruct the particles. And you can see at the top this nanoparticle that corresponds to a solution that is very similar in size to the um, virus we've discussed before in the sense that it has also 72 local five-foot axes, or I should say 12 global and 60 local five-foot axes, but otherwise has three-foot axes that the virus in this case wouldn't form because it's a different type of building block. But what we see from this example is that the tiling approach is quite powerful if 
adapted to the biological specifics of the virus we're talking about, the, the, the protein we're talking about, to classify structures that then can be used for a host of applications. Next slide, please. And ongoing work at the moment um, with my postdoc Fazat Fateh is looking at that problem for a different type of nanoparticle. These are again pentamers that are coming together to form all types of cage structures. These pentamers have specific interaction patterns that we can basically classify in two ways. So they form either trimeric uh, interactions or they form what we call the squashed hexagon. Here's the schematics of that, where six pentagons come together to form this typical type of interactions. And all particles are formed from these local interaction patterns. So what we've done here in this work is to revisit the lattice approach again, go up to K-uniform tilings and look what sort of lattices are available that actually represent the interaction pattern. So the trick here is that you can't find a lattice without gaps for the five-fold building blocks, but you can find lattices for the interaction networks because these are crystallographic. So use the interaction networks as a detour to tackle the problem and then you find a way of mapping the interaction networks onto three-dimensional structures by aligning the symmetry axis of the lattice with the symmetry axis of the structures. So in other words, if you've got the cube, you align the four-fold and three-fold axes uh, with each other. So you have a mapping of the plane onto the cube, and then you basically do a spherical projection to get the viral structures or the protein structures on the right-hand side here. So this is shown for, um, this construction um, is shown here for two structures that already were known from the biology, but our construction has also resided in structures that were not yet known. So this can serve as a roadmap to show our colleagues in the experimental field which type of structures they can potentially um, gain when they um, when they look at the self-assembly and change the properties of the assembly conditions. So for instance, for different pH values or for different concentrations or other, other uh, parameters, they can vary. They see different types of particles and this classification can help to pinpoint what can potentially be found and seen in these examples. And we're working with groups in Krakow on this uh, at the moment. Next slide, please. So I want to segue now into another uh, aspect of this problem, and that is to do with the interactions of the proteins with the viral genome. Until now, we have looked at experiments where the capsule proteins or the the novo designed proteins are used in isolation to assemble higher ordered structures. But in virology, the, and especially in RNA viruses, these containers assemble around RNAs, around viral genomes, and as I'm going to show you in this part of my talk, interactions between the viral genome and the protein container are very important for the formation of the cups and cannot be neglected. Next slide, please. And in order to do that, we need a different type of mathematical approach here. So until now, we have described these protein assemblies as surface lattices, which is absolutely fine for the questions we've addressed so far. But in this problem here, we need 3D information in a sense to have information at different radial levels of the structure, not just a protein layer, but also its relation to the organization of the genomic material inside. So obviously I haven't got enough time here to go into the nitty gritty, but I want to say what you're doing here is you use affine extensions of the icosahedral group to generate structures that are nested polyhedral structures in 3D, um, where every vertex is connected to every other vertex by an action of the symmetry group. I've got on the left hand side a very simple example of that with five fold symmetry, but you want to imagine that you generalize this to acquisitive symmetry in the next step. So imagine you have five fold symmetry, you have this little pentagon. Now you are introducing a translation with it. So you move this pentagon in space and propagate therefore this 
um, this pentagon in the whole plane. And what you're doing is you look for translations which are such that there are relations between the vertices that you generate in this process. You translate, you rotate, so you have the group action of all the combinations of translations and rotations. And if you do that, then you build up these nested polyhedral shells here that are all connected um, with the um, original group structure. This has its origins, if you wish, in this lattice approach that we had before, I've seen before. So if you think about the vertices of a Penrose tilings, can I generate a subset of that in a growing manner by using iterations of a symmetry group? And that's indeed the motivation for the study. We also have work, and I haven't got the slide for that, where we just extend symmetry groups in a high dimensional space and then project those extended symmetry groups. These are all mathematically related and it's probably too far reaching at this point to go into the subtleties of that, but ask me at the end of this uh, talk if you want to know. But all I need at this point is to tell you that we can in this way construct these nested point arrays. We have a control over the variety of the ones that are possible as extensions of the acquisitive group if we want this extended group to be non-trivial, i.e. not the free group, but have some uh, non-trivial relations with um, uh, between the generators. Now, unfortunately, the movie has <laughs> run away. Can you start the movie again? Or is this difficult if you click on the movie again? Um, I would like to show you this. So this movie is basically showing you the application of one of these nested sets in three dimensions on a viral geometry. And as you can see here, you have the outer shell and the outermost vertices are mapping on these turrets of the structure. But when you're then zooming in even more, you see that the other vertices that come packaged and parcel fall on the material boundaries of that structure at different radial levels. And what's really exciting to note is that there are also vertices that fall into what we call the minor and major grooves of this RNA molecule that's inside here. That is really important as we're going to see in the applications in a minute. But before we go there, let us take in the movie. Let's see now that we're stripping away anything except six protein units so that we can look at their detailed structures in terms of sheets and helices and see once more how the different vertices encase, as we say, these protein structures. But I'd like you to, to look in particular at the vertices that are coming in a minute now, um, after we have the protein seen from the top and it's tilted backwards, because at this moment you can see what it actually says about the placement of the RNA, of the positioning of the RNA, and watch the vertices now, how they're sitting in the minor grooves of that molecule. So we see there is um, in-depth information in this structure that we can potentially exploit. And that's what we're going to do on the next slide. Could we move forward, please? Yeah, so here we see the same procedure applied to a different structure. This is bacteriophage MS2. You see on the outside the protein layer and further inside in light blue and yellow and green, you see the genomic RNA in this uh, cryem structure. Now, if you zoom in at the places where the arrows are, then you see at the top of that structure, the protein, and at the bottom you see this orange-blue kind of structure, which is an RNA stem loop. It's part of the viral genome in this case. And what I want you to note is that there are these vertices that are right at the contact points between the protein and the RNA. And this is quite important because these are actually the vertices that we want to use to analyze the organization of this genomic RNA further. So at the bottom, what you see again is a polyhedron that corresponds to the outermost RNA shell. This is the blue area um, close to the capsid shell. And what you see marked up at the vertices are these structures that we call stem loops. These letters are what make up the RNA. They can self-interact, so the A interacts with the U and so on. There are these, these rules, how they base pair, as we say that. And what we know is that um, particular structures are actually having affinity, as we say, so they have a probability of attachment to the capsid proteins, and they have certain, a certain, um, certain shapes to them and certain sequence determinants to them. And the question at that time was, is there at all such a 
sequence determinant to these contacts? And if so, can we identify which ones there are? Is it possible to find a predictive tool for these types of structures? Because obviously, as you can guess, if you know what these structures are, you can target them with drugs. And indeed, I've got a completely different set of talks, more targeted at a biology a community, where we show that actually we have identified with this method in many, many other viruses what, what these structures are. But let's stay with this example right here and look at this a bit further. So what have we done here then? We have realized that the molecule itself needs to visit these vertices in a different order. And the order in which it visits them can be visualized as what we call a Hamiltonian pass, a connected pass that visits these different vertices um, on this polyhedral shell. Now, in a reality situation, it is sometimes possible that only part of a Hamiltonian pass is realized. So we're not saying it always has to realize everything. What we're saying here is this is a book keeping device that tells us the order in which vertices are visited. And we can use this for combinatorial purposes, for data analysis purposes, and then next step. So what you see at the bottom here is actually a board game that Hamilton has designed. Um, it's these Hamiltonian paths again. He asks for a traveling salesman problem. Um, someone wants to visit different cities, which are the vertices, and um, visit everyone precisely once. And that's the, the question we are faced with here. It's basically a traveling salesman problem that we need to solve. Uh, next slide, please. So then, what we're doing is we are combining this information with a bioinformatics analysis. What we're doing is to look for all types of stem loops. These are these little lollipops. These are again representing, you can see more examples on the right hand side. They um, represent these little RNA structures we've seen on the previous slide. Now, we obviously overshoot if we're looking for potential candidates because the difficulty with this mechanism is, as we've learned over the years, that there is a core motif that is very sparse and cryptic, and that certain variations are tolerated around this motif. And depending on how these variations occur, the affinity, so the probability of attachment of that structure to the protein varies. That makes it extremely difficult to identify them because you have a moving target in some way with a very, very sparse consensus motif. Um, made worse is this is by the fact that actually it also needs to present that motif in a certain shape and there's variability around the shape but if it's not presented in the right context again it cannot act in the right way so but this can actually be helped with the mathematics so our friend here is the combinatorics and the mathematics because it embodies for us geometric constraints on what these locations have to fulfill and only once we did the work did I appreciate how powerful this actually is, because if you would have asked me before if it works, I was always like, <laughs> think, okay, let's try it. And but, but we thought, my goodness, can it do all? Can we go back one more time, please? I don't know why I moved forward. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so, so but, but you can actually use the geometry to read out. And when you do so, you can actually then find these. And I just want to reiterate what we actually have found and it's on the right hand side. We call this packaging second media assembly. We, ha we have seen that in the um, letter sequence, if we call it the primary sequences of the viral genomes, um, there are patterns that are determined by certain letter combinations that if presented in specific positions with regards to these secondary structures, so these geometric shape that the RNA makes, then they can act collectively in promoting the formation of this capsid shell. And by now we understand that this is not just in bacteriophages and small viruses, but this principle holds up to major viral pathogens, which is quite exciting. And there's a whole body of work again um, where we where we do this. But uh, next slide, please. But obviously here I would like to focus more on the mathematical aspect. So I would now like to address the question, can we actually understand a bit better how this mechanism works? And the problem we have being faced with is very similar to a problem known for protein folding in that if the virus were to explore all possible ways of attaching those protein units, there would be so many assembly pathways that would take 
a very, very long time to arrive at the right solution. Indeed, if you compare experiments where for the simple virus again, this bacteriophage MS2, for where only its protein building blocks are isolated and assembled in isolation, or where they are assembled in the presence of the genetic material, you see that the former, i.e. in isolation, takes on the order of days to assemble, whereas the other, the order of minutes to assemble. So clearly there is an enormous fitness gain to be had from having the genomic material present. And this mechanism is what actually accounts for it. But let us understand how it does that. So let's go one step further. Ah, thank you. So here's a simple model where we just use the simplest icosahedral structure, which is a dodecahedron. We say we take pentameric five-fold symmetric building blocks, and we take a fictitious RNA that has 12 binding sites. The color coding tells us in bands whether it's strong intermediate or weak interactions. We found in this work that it's enough to compartmentalize this into blocks. We don't need to be more detailed to learn the essence of this mechanism. So then we have these reactions where proteins can bind and unbind, and if they are located next to each other on the RNA, they can um, interact with each other and the, start to form these intermediates and eventually the full uh, viral structure. Geometry is important in this case because it gives us a handle over these different types of structures you can see. So if you have an intermediate, it's not only important what the protein structure looks like. So look at E and F on the right hand side. They have each four pentamers in the same positions, but they have been recruited to the growing capsid in a different order, which is denoted by this red line, which is part of a Hamiltonian pass. In this case, the Hamiltonian pass is eventually um, it's passed on an icosahedron, and the structure we are forming from protein is a dodecahedron. Next slide, please. So what we're then doing is to randomly generate different strings of beads that are formed from these three colors, where green means a strong interaction with protein, blue is intermediate, and red is a weak interaction. And then for these, in this case, 30,000 structures, we are looking how well, if we take the same structure 2,000 times and we offer it a protein, how well they assemble. And you see there is a very big difference between them. So the distribution of these affinities matters. But what's more important is that, um, see this on the bottom perhaps, is the nucleation um, that, that occurs in, in this context. If you put all the protein into your simulation at once, which means we are not ramping up the concentration of protein, this is called minus ramp, then you have, even for a good, well-evolved RNA, so for one of the better distributions, you see it nucleates in different positions and basically you haven't got a very well-defined nucleation site. But if you're working in a systems biology approach where you say, actually in a real viral infection, protein concentration is only synthesized while assembly already takes place, as is realistic in this case, then you see that this mechanism would lead to the fact that you get nucleated assembly. But again, if you were to repeat this for an RNA that's not got the right distribution, you wouldn't get that benefit. So what I'm saying here in many words is that these viral genomes have evolved to present specific distributions of affinities. And we said earlier, this can be tuned by variation around the uh, consensus motif or the stability of these stem loops. So they, they tune this in the evolutionary uh, timeframes to have the right distribution that enable the virus to assemble very efficiently, but only when protein is rammed, i.e. even it mimics what happens in a real viral infection. And again, you can use these Hamiltonian paths, you can use the combinatorics here to, to understand what's actually going on. So here is a a graph which on the x-axis shows you the different types of Hamiltonian paths you can have on an icosahedron, and on the y-axis how many actually occur in these simulations. So it's a way of, of harvesting the data from the simulation, of interpreting the outcome from the simulation. So what you see is with the RAMP there is a 
very strong bias to a small number of Hamiltonian paths, a small number of build-ups. And actually they are, when you look up their geometries, they're actually very similar. It's often very small differences between them. But if you do not have the rump, then actually you have a much wider distribution of different build-ups. This is quite interesting for us because this reveals how the mechanism actually works and um, that's very important if you want to exploit it, for instance, code it into, um, into, into, into genomes to make their assembly better if we, uh, for some applications. Next slide, please. Now, here is um, a collaboration we've had um, on a bacterial um, enzyme that is evolved in a laboratory environment to select for structures that encapsulate their cargo very well. What these people did is they used the bacterial enzyme and what is called cyclically permuted it. This means they fused the amino acid sequence or so the sequence that makes up the protein, they fused it in some places and released a so-called arm into the interior. And that was necessary because they wanted it to recognize the so-called packaging signal, as we've discussed before, of a bacteriophage of bacteriophage lambda, because they wanted to make sure that the genome gets actually encapsulated into these structures. So what they saw then when they evolved it in a laboratory environment it was under the selective pressure that it has to form um, good shells, otherwise nuclease is, is, is a treatment means it would digest um, the genetic material if it's not protected. So it's a way of only bringing forward to the next generation those containers that really protect their cargo. So by doing this and then amplifying this and, and doing several rounds of um, evolution, they saw two very exciting features. Number one, Larger particle morphologies have evolved in this way. And number two, the packaging efficiency of these genomes has increased dramatically. Next slide, please. So here you see first this uh, geometric aspect. You see the smaller particles that become NC1 is one of the earlier rounds of um, evolution. You see how they then um, become eventually larger and larger assemblies. And here happens a phenomenon that I was mentioning at the beginning of this talk, and that is this protein exploits a degree of freedom in the lattice architecture. If you have these lattices that are not the hexagonal lattices from Caspar and Klug, but these lattices formed from hexagons and triangles, then the virus can exploit lattice gyration, which means, as you can see here in this case, that the triangular units become larger and larger. Oh, can we go back, please, again to the previous slide? I don't know. I lost the previous slide. Yeah, thank you. And um, so they can exploit it. And what happens is that this protein actually does, this domain here is actually occupying in larger particles these extra degrees of freedoms in a curated lattice. So we can see already at play here the, the how, how biology uses the full spectrum of possibilities that geometry has on offer and perhaps highlights again why it is so important to really look at all these different lattices and have this full classification as an extension of Caspar Klug theory. But um, on the next slide, please. Let us now look at the packaging. So what we see here is um, the content of these different particles at different rounds of infection. So the uh, actually messenger RNA is the blue. Then we have some mispackaging from the plasmid and from the E. coli it is the bacterium in which this whole process takes place. So we have some mispackaging as well. And you can see in the earlier rounds, there is a little bit of specific packaging, but not so much. But in later rounds, that becomes more and more prominent. And actually there's a big jump from round three to round four. And this is where we um, started collaborating with our colleagues. So our colleagues had a poster on this and I, I happened to see this poster at a conference and said, I think this is our mechanism again. And so we started collaborating to see if we can prove that. And indeed, what we've done here is then we've been able to show um, using some new analysis techniques that we developed. So we do a lot of bioinformatics. We spoke bioinformatics in my team as well, together with a new um, technique that we've developed with our colleagues in, in Leeds, which is a new um, way of structure probing of these structures. Again, it could be its own talk almost. Um, so suffice it to say that um, bringing all of that to bear, what we were able to show is that indeed these um, genomes have evolved these 
packaging signals and cassette of these packaging signals and this is a way of accounting for the fact that we have this enormous increase and now we are actually understanding this mechanism well enough that we can exploit it in many applications and we're working this industry on that so finally i don't know how much time i've got but i would like to at least show you a little bit of that if i can so i lost track of time because of our um, hiccups at the beginning i think there should be quite a bit more time so i'd like to go into that a little bit so if you can move forward So here is um, another example that shows us how important actually this interplay of RNA and protein is. This is again an experiment with the group in Krakow. This is only on the protein layer, but it is on this protein that actually requires these packaging signals in order to take on the, 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 the correct shape of that um, container. So why is that? Well, we have these two types of protein dimers in this case. One is asymmetric, one is symmetric, and the asymmetric form is needed around the particle five-fold axis because there's a little bit less room geometrically. So it's a way for the biology to accommodate this um, sort of tighter space around the five-fold axis. Now, our colleagues here want to use just a protein container for vaccine applications. And what they're doing is they're inserting additional amino acid sequences into these proteins at the, in the parts that point towards the outside of the particle. This is um, so-called spy tag because they want to put antigens on the outside so they want to put other uh, units protein units on the outside that are important for vaccine applications uh, with the spy catcher so spy catcher spy tag um, applications but when they did that they found something very peculiar if we go to the next slide and that's how they arrived with us again because they said what was puzzling to them is that instead of the morphology that we're seeing in the virus which is the um T equals three structure, which is shown in blue here, which is found from 180 proteins, they suddenly see particles with different types of symmetries and the mix of them under different conditions. And they said, well, this is both a problem and an opportunity. The opportunity is that if we understand how this works, we can actually tune it and we get control over this and we can potentially make the room inside the particle larger for certain applications. We want to be able to at will change the volume. But also it's a problem, how do we model this and how do we understand this? How do we rationalize this? So next slide, please. So here it helped me um, when they came to talk to me and, and, and said, is there any way you can help us with that? It helped me that I knew about this virus before and about these packaging signals, because what um, we've seen previously on previous slides, but which I haven't really explicitly said is that the binding of these um, packaging signals actually shifts the reaction that interconverts the symmetric into the asymmetric form of the dimer towards the asymmetric form. So in solution, you readily have both present, but you have a higher probability of finding the symmetric form, which is also why it takes so long in the absence of RNA for these particles to assemble. But now when um, this structure is bound to the dimer, it changes its dynamic properties. There's earlier work that we've had where we basically dissected how this happens, got to do with the normal modes with this of the structure, which basically tells us there is a displacement of the kinetic energy that results in eventually into this flip being more probable in the structures that have the um, uh, packaging signal bound. And therefore it shifts the reaction towards this other type of dimer. Now, in, from a geometric point of view, in a fully formed capsid, we need 60 of those asymmetric dimers and 30 of the symmetric dimer. But if we now look at the other morphologies that are presented when we see these spy tag inserts, then we see that obviously, according to Euler's theorem, we again expect just 60 of those AB dimers, these asymmetric dimers, but now we have a varying number of the symmetric dimers, the CC dimer, and in fact, they all accommodate more of the symmetric dimer than the others. So clearly there is this, this the fact that there is this shift has potentially not happened properly in the absence of, of these structures, or as we hypothesized here, 
actually has been even inhibited by the insert of the spy tags because they have impacted on the kinetic behavior of the dimer and therefore have made that flip less probable. Um, so therefore, we see now a shift towards these other particles that use more of these symmetric dimers. Now we needed to develop some theory to, to, to prove whether that's the case, so if we can go forward. Yeah, so what we do again, we use our insights from tiling theory. So in the first instance, we render all these different structures in terms of tilings. And then we are creating so-called split trees where we look at those units that they all have in common and then basically introduce a split if the placement of a symmetric or asymmetric dimer next distinguishes between the assembly pathways. So in this way, you get this network which resides at the bottom in the different particle structures and the interconnectedness between them regarding their geometries, their local geometries. So then if we go forward, So this is the entire split tree, and we take out the geometries themselves. We just count how many of each are in there. These are the so-called assembly graphs. And what we're now doing is kinetic theory on an assembly graph. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is these Gillespie type algorithms where we start building up the structures. We, everything that's in one edge is considered as one big step because there is not much possibility of variation. At the splits, um, corners, we have the possibility of um, basically of, of building a next an AB or CC. So depending on the relative probability of these two units, you can see that material flows in a different way along these pathways. And this interconversion again is governed by a rate F, which is actually what we want to look at. So we want to prove in the end that it's actually F that governs the outcome that we're seeing. Now, we had data for different types of inserts. So we have, for different modification of the dimer, a different breakdown of these structures. And what we wanted to show and actually have shown in the end is that we can account for all of those just by varying f. So we basically use one of them to parameterize the splits, the constants that are in the model. And then we show that for the others, for the other solutions, we again get the breakdown just by varying the interconversion rate of the symmetric and the asymmetric dimers. So this is a way of showing that this is really what accounts for the outcome in the end. Um, can we go forward, please? So here's an example of that. I only showed two of them. We had more, but I used the one we, uh, that was used to actually parameterize the model and then the other one that basically um, was obtained by just allowing this interconversion rate f between the symmetric and the asymmetric dimer to vary. And you can see that actually this tells us that these different types of inserts really have had the differential impact on the interconversion of these two dimer types. And also, as you can see here, we are quite fairly well representing what's seen as in the experiment here. So with this, we were able to show that there is actually this connection between the um, interconversion of the units and the experimental outcome, which is quite important for us because now we can use this to tune our particles for applications of interest. Can we have the next slide, please? So in this, so for this last part, what I've shown you then is that the um, understanding from tiling theory gives us a new level of control over particle morphism, over the outcome that we can get in these types of experiments. And it gives us insight into the pathways by which we are achieving this. So it's a, it's a, it's a basic platform to design um, new particle types. And we're working also with groups in Bonn, in Germany, um, that are actually de novo designing these protein containers by designing new building blocks and then assembling those containers from these type of protein building blocks they design. And again, this type of mathematics helps in this context and we are actually actively exploiting it for those purposes. Next slide, please.
So in summary for the whole talk, I would like to say that so viral geometry is really for me like a microscope. It allows you to understand aspects of viruses that you wouldn't see just by perhaps um, looking at them in isolation. And an example at the beginning was the disassembly of viruses, the robustness to, to, to disassembly, um, the resilience to disassembly, but also, as we've seen later on in the talk, the assembly of the viruses and the roles that the genomic material uh, can play in the efficient assembly of these containers. We have been able in this way to identify and discover mechanisms in different groups of viruses. And we are exploiting this at the moment together with uh, industrial partners and our experimental colleagues in different ways. So first for antiviral therapy, but also quite a lot in virus nanotechnology. And with this, I come to my last slide. This is my thanks. So I would like to thank my wonderful team on the left hand side. <laughs> Once we're there, yes. And our collaborators, we have um, large scale welcome trust funding with an experimental team of Peter Stockley, but we are also working with, with many other teams here. So I've mentioned the people um, whose data in this talk and actually sort of real, realized that as an omission, the, the group in Krakow is meant I apologize. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's Heddle Lab, of course, and the Azuma Lab, and also um, many more other teams um, working on the nanotechnology. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and take questions. Okay, the floor is open for questions. Terrific talk. Thank you. I've got one question for you, Ryden. If, how does the geometry of the RNA nanoparticle affect the way that the, the virus is then delivered? Does the, does the capsid come apart in certain specific ways because of the structure? Oh, beautiful question. So we just had a paper come out that would have been in a more biological talk, but it's actually a really, really, really interesting question. So because let's take one of these examples, bacteriophage MS2 again, where we said there are these contacts between the RNA and the protein layer that help with the assembly. But then the question is, how does it release the genome if we have all these contacts? And what we found is using this new technology that we've developed of this extra synchrotron footprinting and our new analysis pipelines, that what happens is that the these um, packaging signals are not only tuned with different affinities to optimize assembly, but they are also tuned so that the weaker contacts are in geometrically meaningful positions to create weak spots in the capsid area that then are the places where the ruptures and the fractures happen first. So in other words, we have our viral capsids and then we have areas which are in contact with only weak packaging signal contacts that can then fall off. And these are the first points of contact. And what's even more interesting is that in the vicinity of this um, area where the weak contacts sit, is an element of symmetry breaking that comes from the fact something I've glossed over in the interest of time. There is often one asymmetric feature in these containers that is both important for nucleation of assembly as well. In this case, it's a single protein that is coming out of the shell first and is basically interiorized by this um, by this bacterium, but. This is the place where the weak contact sits. So around that asymmetric feature sit the weak contacts in the capsid shell. And they sit in a really interesting position with regards to the five-fold symmetry axis so as to optimally allow the particle to release the genome there. And what's even more beautiful is then that the end of the genome that needs to come out first is also in this area because otherwise you would want to ask the question how does the virus actually achieve that it breaks at the place where the end of the RNA is so that it can make a, um, not only a controlled release but also release in a way that is not presenting too much of the RNA to the host defenses that could then digest it before it can do much harm. So it's actually keeping protection maximal in this case but is very coordinated in a very coordinated way 
um, breaking the symmetry and breaking the cup set. So yes, it's a really important question. And we have a whole welcome trust program at the moment for just new funding for next October five year program to just look at that question in, in major wire systems. Very interesting indeed. Thank you. Other questions, please. I would have a question, if I may. Please, yeah. Be beautiful talk, Raidun. Uh, Thank you. In connection with uh, one of the slides in the early part of the talk, where you looked at the optimal, let's say, way to disconnect the network of interactions of capsomeres and so on. Yeah. So, uh, if you use an optimality principle, let's say, to disconnect it, probably there is one optimal way to do to do it. No, so which might correspond to a possible disassembly pathway for uh, the capsid. So are there any data that one might use from experiments that would allow you to say whether this optimal way of disconnecting or rupturing the interaction network corresponds to the disassembly pathway or even the time reversal of the assembly one? Very beautiful question. So in, in this case, the data that are available are not necessarily on the pathways because it's very difficult, I think, in experimental work at the moment due to the speed in which things assemble and disassemble to image these intermediates. But what Slotnik has done, he has pacified, as they say, some of the subunits so they react differently from the other subunits so they can easier be um, basically taken out. And he has looked at the ratio of those. And what he found for hepatitis B virus, that about 25% must be removed before the capsid for the first time falls in two parts. And that's exactly working with our fragmentation threshold. So this is the value that we are also finding of 0.25. So there is something in the model that reflects what is seen in experiment. But I totally agree with you. This is, I think you have absolutely the right hunch there, because it is again a matter of these bond energies and clearly something is easier to take out if there are less bonds. So it will again go um, break things easier where there are fewer bonds that hold it in place. Like in the opposite way, when you do assembly, uh, inter um, a species that comes in, a pentamer cell that comes in and can form more contacts at once in one position than another, it's more likely to go where it can make more contacts. So it's driven by the energetics of the bonds and, and, and the release in the opposite way, it's easier to fragment where there are less bonds on a plaquette. So yes, you're absolutely right. It's almost the opposite problem. Great, thanks. Thank you.